Okay, so really today I'd like to look at some more paler series. It's not the maybe the most exciting thing to be doing, but Taylor series are so important that it wouldn't do to not look at examples, really. So yesterday we looked at um, the cosine, as I recall, the sum from zero to infinity of, well, let me, let me write it down and then we can try to put it into sigma notation. Let's see, the cosine is even, one x to the zero minus one over two factorial times x squared plus, now that I've got the first few terms down, I can do this pretty mechanically. This is the pattern that shows up. And I've written that sigma and then I erased it. And it's an interesting question. Can we write this series using sigma notation? Um, because, for example, if we wanted to use the ratio test to look at the radius of convergence of this series, um, to use the ratio test, you need to look at this ratio. And to look at this ratio, you have to know what a sub n plus one and a sub n are. And there are a few standard, a few kind of standard tricks here. Um, we want to have even numbers, but not odd numbers here. That's the basic point. Um, I This always kind of feels like it's throwing the pattern off. One is one X to the zero power. So, we do have even numbers starting with zero, even that one, which is one over zero factorial. We have the even number zero. So even numbers are numbers that can be written as two times another number, like six, two times three, eight, two times four, and so on. Uh, 36, two times 18. Even numbers are by definition two times another number. So what we could do here is we could say, well, we want the even numbers, so we'll put a 2n factorial, and then we'll have a 2n power. And we can start with zero. And this is how we can write this compactly, almost using um, sigma notation. I, I cor course corrected at the last minute with that almost, because this still isn't quite it. We want the even powers, that's good, we have that. Um, 
we want to alternate between positive and negative, and we don't have that. And that's where, even if we don't use the alternating series test, section 10.6, I want to say, um, the alternating series test is useful because in that section, we saw how to write alternating series. Negative one raised to a power. Negative one raised to n works in this case. And here is this written as compactly as an alternating power series. And if you found the radius of convergence, this radius of convergence is infinite. Um, do I want to do that? Sure, sure. That's uh, I've claimed that the ratio test is good for this kind of thing. And I've claimed that these Taylor series are really the main act application of all of this convergence and divergence stuff. So it would be a shame not to do an example. Let's go to, let's, well, we'll alternate between this frame and the next frame while I jot stuff down. Negative one to the n plus one, x to the two, n plus one. And in the denominator, two times n plus one, factorial and if we then divide this by negative one to the n x to the two n over two n factorial Oh, this is an ugly looking fraction, isn't it? Well, there's not much to be done about that. Sometimes when you're finding using the ratio test, you get ugly looking fractions, as of course you have discovered in the homework. The homework was mostly good, by the way, so I won't. well on this. Um, when we multiply top and bottom by the reciprocal of that denominator, we end up with these terms in the top and in the bottom, there's a negative one to the n and an x to the two n and uh, 2n plus 2 factorial. And oops, I didn't write in the absolute values just for space. But there are absolute values. And now, and again, raise your hand if you have questions. So I'm never obviously going to just plow ahead if people don't understand what's happening. I'm just, I did look at the ratio test homework. People seemed confident in the ratio test. I don't want to just plow ahead, but I also don't 
want to waste everyone's time if no one is really struggling with this. The negative ones cancel. The X's partially cancel. And this is 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 times 2n factorial. The factorials are the stuff that I always maybe have to pause a moment with because we're not used to working with them. At least I assume we're not used to working with them. And as n goes to infinity, well, this negative one, I won't recopy everything, but a negative one in an absolute value isn't doing anything. X squared is going to X squared. One over infinity squared, obviously very informal notation, but I think it's helpful. So x squared times zero is zero. This limit is zero. Zero is always less than one. So we're golden. This series converges everywhere. And again, because I'm not spending an entire section on this, I will just mention there are Taylor series that converge everywhere, but don't equal the function that generated them. It is possible for that to happen, but those examples are all these ugly things grown in a laboratory and designed to not work well. In our day-to-day -day life, that's not a problem that we encounter or worry about. So some examples, I really don't want to rush Taylor series. If we end up only covering one section this week, well, it was a section that was worth the time. Um, let's look at the cosine again. And this time, let's use a center other than zero. Let's look at A equals 15. Yesterday, we found the Taylor series around zero, and it was really nice. But I mean, part of the reason it was so nice is that the cosine of zero and the sine of zero are both nice numbers. So let's see what happens if we look at some less nice numbers. And let's try to remember, I say try to remember, this is something that just at the, I mean, I can't, I'm not pretending that a decade from now you'll be able to do Taylor series from memory, but as long as you're in this class, this needs to be in your memory banks. It's the nth derivative at whatever number we're looking at, divided by n factorial, and then our terms x minus a to the power of n. And we start, be careful, because we start at zero. We have mostly been looking at series that start at one. So this is a difference. And I guess 
I guess if we're going to start at zero, we need to have an understanding that the zero derivative of the function is just the function. So the cosine of fifth, so our, let's just look at the first four terms. One, two, three, four. Maybe we'll look at the first five or so terms. So term is zero. The original function, the zeroth derivative, evaluated at the center. So the cosine of 15 over zero factorial, then x minus 15 to the zeroth power. The first derivative. Um, the derivative. So here, this is here. Let's renumber these. So this is n equals zero. N equals one. So the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. So the negative sine of 15 over one factorial times x minus 15 to the first. And now this pattern is gonna keep repeating the derivative of the negative sine is the negative cosine. So the negative cosine of 15 over two factorial times x minus 15 squared. Oh, let me... Let's see, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sign. So the derivative of the negative cosine is the positive sign. No shame if you are still doing stuff like that. I am still doing stuff like that a decade later. And that's just, I mean, I certainly hope we're on the right track. But let's go to Desmos and let's take a look at all of this and let's see if we really are doing what we're supposed to be doing. It would be dispiriting if we weren't, but we want the cosine of x and we're interested in this value, um, the point 15 comma, the cosine of 15. And let's, I'm going to have to go back and forth here. The cosine of 15 times zero divided by zero factorial, times x minus 15 to the zeros power. U, is that really what we want? I might have cursed us when I made that comment about hopefully everything is good. Um, But if it's not 
I'll figure out what the problem is and we'll throw it up Thursday. I won't obsess about it now. Minus the sine of 15 over one factorial. times x minus 15 to the first power. This is looking a little more promising. Minus the cosine of 15 over 2 factorial. times x minus 15. Okay, where we are good. We are really starting to look like this function. So let's see, the derivative of the negative cosine is the, so the next term is this positive sine of 15 over three factorial times x minus 15 cubed, and let's zoom out. And let's see, these were all the terms I think that I put on the whiteboard, but we could keep going. So the derivative of the sine is the positive cosine. We've got a four factorial, x minus 15 to the fourth power. And you see we are um, starting to look more and more like the cosine. We look a lot like the cosine near the center. And we still kind of look like the cosine in an interval around the center. And the more terms we add, the more we'll look like the cosine. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sine, five factorial x minus 15, sorry, raise that to the fifth power. The derivative then the derivative of the negative sign, this will be the first, the last term I write. The derivative of the negative sign is the negative cosine. There. So a good approximation near the center then it gets better and better as we sort of, well, no, it gets worse. It starts good near the center, but then it does get worse and worse as we move far away. Um, tying this to something I said earlier, um, or may, maybe I'll wait until we to look at the natural logarithm to do this actually. Um, but we are getting this good approximation near 15. So the only thing we really need for this Taylor series approximation to be good, we really need to have one value that we're staying in. Like, if we were interested in what happens at 15 and we're interested in what happens at negative four, then we're in trouble because you can see that at negative four, this, uh, this approximation is not even visible. It's nowhere, nowhere close to approximating the function. So this is local in that sense. And I mean, the good news is that in the overwhelming majority of cases, um, we are just staying near some value, I think. 
like if they're doing drug dosage is a patient is, you know, out for surgery, you're keeping the level of anesthesia near some value to keep the patient unconscious without harming them. So, I mean, this isn't, you know, this terrible restriction that means this material can't be used. I would say that in the majority of real world situations, we have a value and then we're interested in what happens near that to value. Still, it is something to be aware of. You know, with the rise, Oh, never mind. I was going to say with the rise of cultivator technology, I think you might even be able to, well, this obviously isn't cultivator, but with the rise of technology, I think that if we tell Desmos that f of x is the cosine, It might not understand the zeroth derivative, but I think we might be able to do f prime of 15 over one factorial times x minus 15 to the first. And yeah, we in fact can do that. Desmos, at least if our function isn't too horrible, can just handle the derivative for us even. So thus, there might be some limit to how many derivatives it will take, but the second derivative at 15 over 2 factorial x minus 15 squared, that's pretty neat. I will not, uh, because it must be very tedious, I will not experiment to see what the highest derivative we can make Desmos take for us is. But that's cool. So there are a few examples we should look at, and we looked at the cosine, um, you know, at some point we should probably look at the sine, but the sine is so similar to the cosine that it might be kind of tedious to do it at this moment. Here's another very famous, very famous Taylor series, e to the x, And let's find this around zero. So the McLaurin series, although I've said that that terminology doesn't get used as often as textbooks might make you think. We are uh, taking the Taylor series of e to the x is super simple. In fact, maybe it should have been my introductory example. And what makes it super simple is the first derivative, the first derivative of e to the x, e to the x. The second derivative, of e to the x, still e to the x. The third derivative of e to the x, still e to the x. So all of these derivatives are going to be e to the x. And e to the zero is one. So all of these derivatives are going to be one. It's a very, uh, very nice in that regard. And now I just have to think. 
And again, there's e to the x and most day-to-day -day functions. I mean, e to the x is equal to its tail or series. So the zeroth derivative, the original function, well, the original function is e to the x, stick to zero in, you get one. Then the first derivative, stick zero in e to the x, you get one. The second derivative, stick zero into e to the x, you get one. The third derivative, stick zero in e to the x, you get one. One plus x over one factorial plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial, plus x four over four factorial. And this pattern repeats itself. And if we go to Desmos and take a look, So we're done with all of this. E to the x. Turn so we can see it. One plus x plus x squared over two factorial. So we're centered at zero. And yeah, near this center, um, we only need uh, to take the, the second power, the quadratic power, to have a really good approximation. And I mean, I say near zero, we don't have to be that near zero, like within the point two of zero, we're already getting some good approximation. And, wow, I mean, we add the third term. Well, maybe that's at the fourth term. And this is, I mean, if we're like within a negative one and positive one, in, if we're in that region, then these four terms basically give us what we want. And again, if we, I mean, if we don't want a value like this, if we're interested in two or three or whatever, we can modify this just like we did with the cosine. And e to the x also, um, I'm going to just say this, the radius of convergence is all of the real numbers. It's like if you were willing to act to you know have a billion terms, a trillion terms, a hundred trillion terms, this does, I mean, this interval that the approximation is good at does just widen and widen and widen until it encompasses the entire real number line. Um, having said that, obviously in practice, it probably go. I shouldn't say obvious, but it probably goes without saying that we don't want a tree of in terms in our polynomial. If we're really interested in a value that's far away from zero, we would change 
the center of the tales or series, rather than just add more and more terms. Perhaps our last example for the day, I don't know, it depends on how much time it takes, but let's look. You'll have noticed that in both the Taylor series I prevent, presented, the cosine and the exponential, we center around zero. And, um, and that's true for the sign as well. The standard Taylor series for the sign that everyone commits to memory is the Taylor series centered at zero. Let's do an example where the Taylor series can't be centered at zero. Let's look at the natural logarithm of X. And this can't be centered at zero because the, that logarithm isn't defined at zero. And the logarithm isn't defined at negative numbers. So let's pick a different center. One is a center you see a lot. And let's see what happens with the natural logarithm if we center it at one. One is, I mean, not more than like this, the sine or the cosine or e to the x. You really have to tailor your center to the problem when you're looking at the natural logarithm. So it doesn't really make sense to have a standard center. Nevertheless, most people, when they look at the Taylor series of the natural log, sort of default it to being centered around one. And that's because one does give you a nice Taylor series. N equals zero. Well, the function evaluated, sorry, there's my instincts kicking in, the function evaluated at one is zero. So our constant term will be zero. And then the natural log, uh, n equals zero, that is. And now the first derivative of the natural log is one over X. We plug one in there and we get one as our coefficient. So we're going to have one over one factorial X to the first. n equals two. So even I've taught this course many years and I still have to think when I'm working with these, x one over x is x to the negative first. So we take the derivative of this, we get negative x to the negative second. So negative one over x squared. And we plug one into this and we get negative one. So we're going to have a negative one over two factorial x squared. 
And now our coefficients are going to start to change. I mean, when we looked at the cosine, it was just one and negative one, the same coefficients alternating. When we looked at e to the x, it was, um, well, it was the coefficient was one over and over again. Um, that, of course, can't, can't be expected to happen in general. We take the derivative of one negative one over x squared. That's negative x to the negative second. We take the derivative of this. That's 2x to the negative third. So that's 2 over x cubed. So we stick 1 in here, and we get positive 2. And our next term should be Two over three factorial x cubed. And let's see if any of this looks right. It would be a shame to keep building these terms up and then discover that actually we did something wrong. So let's take a look at the natural log. And let me see, what was it? Zero, then x to the first minus one half, x to the second. Absolutely not. What have we done that's wrong here? Just as well that we yeah. put the factorial in the thing and then in Desmos. And in Desmos. Who fat? Factorial, it's a good catch, but two factorial is just two. So that's not the explanation. Let's, I tried to rush through this. That's always a mistake. N equals zero. the zero derivative of the natural logarithm is the natural logarithm. So our first term should be the natural logarithm of one over zero factorial times x to the zero. And that ought to just be zero, but let me let me put it in. N equals one. The first derivative is one over x. We stick one in here and we get one over one. So our next term should be one over one factorial x to the first. Yeah. 
Well, I'll say what I said for the last problem. If I can't figure out what's happening pretty quickly, I'll just call it and then go back to it tomorrow. But n equals two. So we want the second derivative. So the um, derivative of x to the negative first is negative x to the negative two, which is negative one over x squared. Stick one in here, we get negative one. So negative one over two factorial x squared. Okay, let's give this one more term to shape up. And if it doesn't, we'll have to concede that something's gone wrong. So this is the zeroth derivative, first derivative, second derivative, the third derivative at one divided by three factorial x cubed. No, I don't, I'm doing something wrong and I don't want to troubleshoot the question. So we need the x, it's in the denominator. So what's in the denominator? The x is in the denominator and it's also in the x is in. We can change to put the, uh, next to the one. Yeah. The x in the, in the, in the denominator. And then it, x in the denominator. Go. Okay, I'm I'm going to uh, stop the recording.